Hi and welcome back to freesciencelessons.co.uk. By the end of this video you should be able to describe how paper chromatography can be used to identify substances. And this is a required practical so it's essential that you learn all the details. Now we've already looked at paper chromatography in the playlist on atomic structure in the periodic table. I'd strongly recommend that you watch that video again before continuing with this one. In this video we're looking at the method for carrying out paper chromatography. We're going to use it to work out the colours in food colouring. So let's get started. We've got a sample of food colouring, which is a mixture of chemicals. We're going to call this U for unknown. We also have four known food colourings that it could contain, and we're going to label these A to D. First, we use a ruler to draw a horizontal pencil line on the chromatography paper. The line should be around 2 cm from the bottom of the paper. We now mark five pencil spots at equal spaces across the line. We need to leave at least one centimetre clear at each side. Next, we use a capillary tube to put a small spot of each of the known food colours and the unknown colour onto the pencil spots. A capillary tube is simply a very thin glass tube. So here's the paper with the food colourings. It's important that we keep the spots relatively small. This prevents the colours from spreading into each other later. Now we pour water into a beaker to a depth of one centimeter. Remember that in this case the water is the solvent. We now attach the paper to a glass rod using tape and we lower the paper into the beaker. The bottom of the paper should dip into the water. Now there are three key points here. Firstly, the pencil line with the spots of ink must be above the surface of the water, otherwise the water will wash the ink off the line. Secondly, the sides of the paper must not touch the side walls of the beaker. If that happens, then it will interfere with the way that the water moves. And lastly, we usually put a lid on the beaker to reduce evaporation of the solvent. Now at this stage, the water will move up the paper and the colours will be carried up. During this time, we need to be careful not to move the beaker. We remove the paper when the water has travelled around three quarters up. At this stage, we use a pencil to mark the point where the water reached. And finally, we hang the paper up to dry. Now as you can see, the unknown colour has separated into three spots, telling us that this is a mixture of three colours. The spots in colours A, C and D line up with the spots in the unknown colour. So this tells us that the unknown colour is a mixture of colours A, C and D. We can also see that the unknown colour does not contain colour B. Now, what if we wanted to identify the chemicals in these colours? Well, to do that, we calculate the RF values. So let's look at that now. The first thing we need to do is measure the distance from the pencil line to the centre of each spot. I'm going to do that for the spot produced by colour A. In this case, the chemical moved a distance of 14 millimetres. We then measure the distance moved by the water from the pencil line. In this case, that distance is 70 millimetres. To calculate the RF value, we divide the distance moved by the chemical by the distance moved by the solvent like this. So this gives us an RF value of 0.2 for the chemical in colour A. Notice that RF values do not have a unit. We can now look this RF value up in a database and that will tell us the identity of the chemical. Now I should point out that several different chemicals could have this RF value, so we might need to repeat this experiment using a different solvent to narrow it down further. Also, if this chemical has never been analysed before, then there will not be an RF value on the database, so we'd need to carry out further analysis to identify it. Remember, you'll find plenty of questions on this required practical in my Vision workbook, and you can get that by clicking on the link above.